Well, the number one uh, reason I think we would all agree that people would be unhappy is failure to hit the refractive target. And I think that's why the uh, uh, new availability of the light adjustable IOL in the United States is a very exciting time for us. Uh, we've got lots of improvements in biometry and formulae, but these improve your mean. They do not eliminate the standard deviation. And that's because for an individual eye, we still may be incorrect in assuming the effective lens position, the posterior corneal astigmatism, or even surgically induced uh, astigmatism from the incision. So now, we'll simply wait, for example, three weeks when everything is stabilized and treat the refraction instead of with glasses with making an adjustment in the IOL. So this will not only improve our standard deviation in our general population, but I think we really need this for the sort of uh, trickiest, uh, highest risk cases, post-refractive, post-RK, uh, people that didn't have good biometry, for example, due to a white cataract. Uh, and then finally, people with maybe asymmetric astigmatism, the bow is not a classic bow tie, uh, with a little form frost keratoconus. Uh, these are eyes that will be ideal for an adjustable IOL. So the one that's uh, in the United States uh, now available is from RX Sight. They were, used to be called Calhoun Vision. It's a three-piece silicone lens, and you use a specific wavelength of UV light to polymerize these diffusible um, molecules or monomers, and that creates a diffusion gradient whereby over, say, two days, the actual shape of the lens changes on a microscopic level, thereby changing the refraction. Uh, so you can move it uh, in th plus or minus three diopters in either direction uh, for the sphere, but you can also correct uh, between three to four uh, diopters of a cylinder. And so the fact this will, I think, be the most accurate way, uh, essentially, to customize the lens uh, for a toric IOL. Uh, you'll be able to treat low amounts, uh, and you'll be able to treat pretty much uh, a wide range of refractive error. Uh, there's another company called Perfect Lens. They're not as far along, of course, and they haven't uh, really entered into clinical human trials yet, uh, but they're using the femtosecond laser to actually modify an existing hydrophobic acrylic IOL in situ. So the idea would be while it's in the eye, you could even change the, the optics in a way you could write a diffractive multifocal pattern, for example, and then write another pattern at a different level of lens to erase that. And of course, then treat sphere and cylinder. So this would be something that people that are already pseudophagic could be a candidate for, and it would allow you to maybe do something different uh, years down the road. Uh, maybe uh, we'd love to have a way to remove a diffractive optic if the patient developed some dry AMD. Uh, so, uh, again, this is not yet in human clinical trials, but this shows, uh, again, what the power of this principle of adjustability could offer. In terms of who would benefit uh, from a light adjustable lens, I think there's three categories. People that absolutely want uh, the best distance vision. Uh, this is basically customizing the lens while it's in your eye, just like you could uh, tailor fit a suit better when I'm wearing it rather than ordering it over the internet like we do with our current IOLs. Another group, you know, a lot of people want a monofocal lens, but they don't necessarily want to be Plano. And the problem is that if you're not pseudophagic, how do you know what's the difference between being Plano and minus 0.75 or, or minus one? Or if you want to read without glasses, how do you know whether it'd be better to be minus 1.5 or minus 2.5? Well, now, I think for those patients, we can let them decide after the cataract surgery, when they're pseudophagic, what they prefer. And I think that's gonna be really powerful because uh, we don't think enough about the dilemma that patients have now. We, we, we do their cataract surgery, then we ask them what type of lens they want and what they wanna see without glasses, and if you've never experienced it before, it's very stressful and anxiety-provoking to try to uh, understand and then decide what you want. 
I think this allows all of that decision making to be done after the operation. And in my office, we'll have an optometrist work all this out with them so that I don't really have to get involved with do they want to be a little less or a little more uh, myopic. It's really going to change things, I think, in terms of refractive lens exchange or also for presbyopia correction. Because so many of my patients um, you know, don't really want the prospect of unwanted night images at night. If we could show it to them and reverse it, that would be fine, but many of them are risk averse or I'm risk averse. So now we have a very powerful way to do mini monovision. So we can use night quality, the quality of monofocal IOLs, adjust one eye for distance, and then try out different amounts of myopia in the second eye. As we all know from contact lenses, different individuals tolerate or prefer different amounts of anisometropia. And one of the reasons we're so successful with contact lens monovision is we can reverse it or switch which eye is dominant or adjust in just enough so that they can read well enough but not experience too much uh, loss of stereopsis. So I think for a, uh, a, a number of our patients, mini monovision will uh, really become more popular now and more powerful with adjustable lens technology.